If it's a non navigable stream, the stream bed on, on one side goes to the middle of the stream, and the stream bed over the other side. So you can have someone that allows people to fish on this side, but if you wait across the, the mid you can't. You can't. You can't. You can't. Yeah. But because the state, the state of conservation natural resources, and the, uh, the game is the official boat fish. You never knew what all the navigable stream was. You know, mapped it was the Department of Conservation Natural Resources mapped it so that they could lease what the, the land under the streams for drilling. And they've leased over 1,500 acres of the stream bed as well. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't even hear about that. Of water? Yeah. That doesn't make sense. I went, wait, wait, I never heard of that. I'm going to talk about that. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. I'm 
write that down. Because I'm, I'm as good as I get that. You know? But you write that down, and that'll, that'll go into consideration by the panel. We do that? You're building a target. You're always saying you're quality. You know, quality. Why is it doing that? 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 Why is it doing that?
And yeah. when my mom passes, I move from the East Coast to my place in Jackson, Wyoming, where it's a state that has no corporate or personal income tax. And even better, it's got dynasty trust laws that allow me to pass family wealth down for a thousand years without paying federal state taxes. Where do you live now? Forks. I have two more questions for you. Oh, okay, go ahead. So you're a lawyer, so you understand the incorporation doctrine? Sure. Okay. So the first and fourth amendment have been incorporated. In 2010, the Second Amendment has been incorporated. So you, you represent a state where Article 1, Section 20 of the state constitution says citizens have the right to bear arms in defense of themselves in the state. This right shall not be questioned, much stronger than the federal one. Since the Second Amendment has been incorporated, how come I can't go two blocks each with a sidearm without getting arrested? I mean, I can go across that bridge and my, my First Amendment rights don't go away, my Fourth Amendment rights go away. And even though the Second Amendment has been fully incorporated by the U.S. Supreme Court through the new process clause of the Fourteenth Amendment, which should bring the Equal Protection Clause in, how come we have to pass a federal law, you know, for national concealed carry reciprocity, and how come you're not supporting it, especially when your constituents have a much stronger right at the state level than they do at the federal level? Why should I have to spend money? For me, I have a carry permit in Pennsylvania, but I can't carry in every state because of reciprocity because some states require training. Pennsylvania doesn't require training. Right. So I have to get a Utah non-resident. That combination allows me to carry in 20, 20, 38 states. If I want to carry in South Carolina, i got to spend money on a Florida non-resident. Right Why do I not have to? Like if I want to publish a newspaper in every state, I don't have to get a license. If I want to practice my religion in every state, I have, don't have to get a license. If I go into different states and get pulled over, I still have the same Fourth Amendment rights. These are incorporated rights, civil rights protected through the Equal Protection Clause. How hard is it to support national concealed carry rights? I was just talking to um, Karen, is the house, about uh, she's got a concealed carry permit. And, uh, just talking about I go over that bridge, man minimal mandatory three and a half years. If I go across that bridge. Yeah. One yeah. Last. And I think it's Share Act. Plans, but it is, yeah. but I'm not sure it's his plan. We're just handling the I do a lot of time recreating out west. In fact, when I go to DEF CON, which is the big hacker convention in Vegas, we actually use federal federal ranges for that. When we have our shoot with all the other hackers, the information security professionals. I, my house in Wyoming is surrounded by federal ranges. There's about four, four or five different bills called the Share Act. This is the one that includes all the range protections, the taking the silencers off the National Fire Act. My hearing is horrible because I used to shoot them. Mine, mine is horrible too. So, yeah. Uh, I'm against uh, uh, I just, uh, and, 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 I mean, just man to man, I'll tell you. I don't like it because it would take, like, for example, if we have uh, Steve Scalise is shooting. Okay. Um, you know the one I'm talking about? Yeah. Crazy people do crazy things. You, other people don't have to give their rights up because crazy people do crazy things. I'm going to ask you to give me the courtesy to finish with my set. It would have taken law enforcement officers longer to locate the if they couldn't hear safely where the gun shot was coming from. Look at Fort Hood. I think a civilian officer off the base to neutralize the shooter because the three of the members of the military were not allowed to carry the military. I mean, carry a gun to protect them. Stay with me on the Scalise shooting. You can refute that. Yeah. Anyway, I'm a gun owner and I shoot and I have hearing protection. I put the things in my my canal and I put the, the over over ear over ear protection. Over ear protection when you go deer hunting? No. So how am I supposed to hear something going through the woods? And I can't use the pressure on the rifle. Yes, I guess we're going to agree to disagree on the theory. Okay, that's fine. I appreciate it, but you know, here's the other thing to think about. I'm very good friends with Cody Wilson, who started Defense Distributed, and did the 3D printing by gun, and the CNC mills to finish the interest on the receivers. I'll tell you what, what I'm hearing through my lawyer friends that work in that thing, and I'm friends with Alan Gurr and stuff, keep your eye on the uh, on the bill that's going to hit the Congress to remove the public fire stocks. Your party won't be gone, but it's going to have a national because what's going to happen is the strategy right now is to amend. We, we have to. No problem. Is to amend. Uh, so can we do it for the bump stock? No, I might be able to. You know, I would. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just trying to charge you moving them around. You know, I'm trying to get to everybody. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
My family, we were in, in Norfolk, Virginia, with my last duty station. We moved back here. We have two young boys, 12 and 6 now, and uh, we to raise them up here. And it wasn't until after this last election that the idea of running for office really was presented to me, and so we considered it. And this last spring, we decided that it's something that we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I put the campaign together, and you now we're running. I mean, our primary focus is our, I, I firmly believe that one of the things that would be more helpful uh, that would take some of the politicization and polarization out of Washington uh, is to have more veterans in Congress on both sides of the aisle. Um, and you know, I don't just mean military combat veterans, I mean diplomats and cops and nurses and right. a lot of people who deal with complex problems on a day-to-day -day basis but don't otherwise allow unrelated partisan issues to enter into the mm -hmm. conversation. Mm -hmm. So I think that what too often happens in the wake of tragedies like this is that the two parties retreat to their corners and they don't really have a meaningful conversation about the core issue, right. which is gun violence, about our ability to reduce the frequency and scope of this type of violence. And it's important to acknowledge that as we look at the broader issue that you know, two-thirds of the gun deaths in America are individual suicide. And then the next most frequent are young men, primarily between the ages of 15 and 25, killing other young men between the ages of 15 and 25. And so, in the total terms of, of total gun violence in America, these types of events are, by comparison, small, but because of the scope and mass of the tragedy with an individual shooter, it's definitely an opportunity for us to talk about Mm -hmm. what we can do. And it, it should never be about one solution. There's never just one solution. You know, it's not just about banning this thing or just about mental health. It's right. about all these There's things. combinations. Absolutely. There's never a single causal factor in this. And so we, we need to take this opportunity to have these conversations. And I believe that as a, as a you know, political leader, you've got to be out listening. Mm -hmm. And that's really a key part of what we're doing. Well, and that, because um, like neighbors fun mm -hmm. us, um, that was a big thing on questions. Mm -hmm. You know, like one in lieu of the Vegas shootings, do we need a national background check? Would that be mm -hmm. a positive thing to do? Well, um, I don't know that a national background check would have stopped this particular shooter. Right. However, uh, he seemed I, to be normal. Yeah. I, it's hard to figure out at this point, right? We don't know a whole lot. So, would you move that? Would you mind moving that chair just to the side there? So, and um, so uh, I think that, that that should be part of the conversation. And, and I, would, I would, I'd look at it this way. So, I'm a gun owner, um, and I actually have my concealed pistol license. It's not because I carry every day. It's simply because, as a gun owner, I think it's responsible to know the gun laws mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and be prepared to safely transport your firearms. Um, and one of the things about the CPL in the state of Michigan that's particularly helpful is that if you are interacting with a law enforcement officer through, say, like a routine traffic stop, that law enforcement officer is aware right. that you are a weapon, you own weapons, you have a pistol license, and you can have open and clear communication with, with that law mm -hmm. enforcement officer. Mm -hmm. At least the CPL does facilitate that. Um, How but, about you know the the, the CPLs. I, I don't have one, yeah. but but I have a driver's license. It's mm -hmm. good in all fifty right. states and some countries. Right. Do you think that the, the the concealed weapon thing should be reciprocal throughout the country? I, I will tell you that I talk to a lot of people with CPLs, people who carry regularly, and the one thing they would like to see is reciprocity among the states. But like we, you know, you you can remember a time when we didn't have reciprocity in terms of driver's license, right? Right. Yeah. right. Well, and yeah. you could get a DUI <laughs> in Indiana, and you could come up to Michigan and get a driver's license. You know, mm -hmm. and now, if you get a DUI in Indiana, uh, and you have a Michigan license, guess what? The state of Michigan is going to take your license away, Correct. right? Because of Correct. reciprocity, and that requires a set of common standards for training, education, and licensing, and it requires a national linked database for them to be able to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. Thus far, 
the NRA has been one of the primary opponents of the national database. So if we want to move that forward and have a better league system, I mean, I, I, I'm firmly of the belief that that there are protections that can be put in place for gun owners. Um, I, for example, would say, you know, I used to teach scuba, right? And when I taught scuba, I was taught a standard of care, a legal standard right. of care. If someone was injured under my supervision, then they could sue me. Well, when I paid my dues as a professional association of diving instructors, diving instructor, right? I paid my dues, part of that was my insurance. I had liability mm -hmm. insurance. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that, one of the reasons why I would be discouraged from carrying on a regular basis is when you get your CPL class and you get your legal training and they explain to you, you know, you give, get legal advice on if you were involved in an altercation that resulted in someone being killed or maimed, you could be completely exonerated or not, you would, police would not press charges, right. you know, even in the best of scenarios. And you'd walk away from that and you would still be exposed to civil legal liability if you killed or maimed yeah, we've, somebody. Yeah, we've seen stories of different yeah. states where right. people seem to be, you know, in the right, but not really knowing other states, and all of a sudden they're being prosecuted. Yeah, and I think that part of the regulation process is it not only provides protections for the individuals, you know, who have a right to walk the streets on a daily basis and mm -hmm. not fear for their lives, but it also provides the protections through civil liability through, for gun owners. Um, and I would like to see processes like that. Mm -hmm. When I would go diving, uh, around the world. When I leave the United States to go diving, I purchased an insurance. Um, hi, how are you? Hi, good. Matt Morgan. Bill Norris. Oh, yeah. Flow. Right. Exactly. Gotcha. Thank you. Pleasure. So, um, so when I would go to a foreign country to go diving, I would purchase insurance that would ensure that if I suffered a diving injury, that I was medevaced to the nearest hyperbaric chamber. Right. 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 So there's a lot, I think that there are a lot of very broad-based solutions that don't involve, by any means, taking sportsmen's guns or handguns away. But I think that as you see, even with the NRA, there's, as gun manufacturers continue to evolve and develop accessories, um, those accessories are gonna have to be regulated in a reasonable way. Mm -hmm. Because a responsible, as a responsible gun owner, I don't wanna see the gun industry move in a direction that creates, puts me and my right to own firearms at risk. Mm -hmm. And I, I hear that a lot, you know, I've gotten hundreds of emails over the last week, and a lot of it is from gun owners who said, you know, I hunt, I have a handgun, I even have my CPL, but I think that things like bump stock, accessories that, that allow you to basically circumvent the federal law against automatic weapons, or suppressors, um, or high, extreme high capacity magazines mm -hmm. are not things that your average gun owner wants, needs, right. and or even can afford in a you know, basic setting. So I think that our conversation needs to be broad based. It can't just be we have to do this or we can't do that. We, get, we can come together. And again, that goes back to my conversation about I was just before we came in here, I was listening to a, a Republican congressman from Virginia and a Democratic congressman from Massachusetts on ABC News having a conversation, <laughs> and both of them are Iraq veterans, you know, and so they have experience with right. firearms, they know the detailed operation and, and capacity <laughs> and effect of those firearms, and so I think we can have reasonable conversations. It's, it's too often that when, particularly when, well, first of all, it's unfortunate that something like this has to happen for us to be able to have these conversations. Well, that's um, usually the only time we do. It, it is. A month or two down the road, it's going to be forgotten. We yeah. are very, our Congress is extremely reactive. Um, and too many in Congress are beholden to specific organizations that have essentially bought their votes. So, that's a and, and, and I had a question about, uh, well, the Pentagon mm -hmm. and all the police forces in this country. Seems like all they have to do is write a letter saying they want XYZ military stuff and it just gets sent to them. It's, uh, it seems to me it's the militarization of our police force. And somehow that just doesn't seem right. right. It's, 
when I when I lived in the Detroit area, there were homicides, robberies with weapons that were confiscated and were supposed to have been destroyed, and all of a sudden they're back in circulation with the, it, with the you know you being used against the police or or citizens, other citizens. It seems like some of these military weapons that are being given away to police forces are the very types of things that we want to, you don't even need the bump stock. I mean, you've got cases of M16s out here. And mm -hmm. I don't know, it just doesn't seem right that our, our police forces should, should, number one, have to be armed like that. And number two, there's the, always that possibility that Military weapons can just filter out into society. You know, I, I don't have a basic. Uh, I mean, we, we we expect our police forces to have the capacity to respond. Right. But right. that said, when when we see the militarization, it, it it also results in a shift in mindset. And I've heard a lot of career law enforcement officers talk about how we've moved away from the notion of community policing. Um, with, with you know the first SWAT units that were created in the mm -hmm. 70s existed really only in a couple of big cities right. but now even your most rural sheriff's departments have SWAT units that are involved in what they call high-risk warrant service mm -hmm. um, and so they create essentially a, a raid type mindset in something as simple as, as serving a warrant uh, of any any kind of felony warrant so I agree. That's that's part of the problem. It, so. it just kind of concerns me, you know. Yeah, and it's it's you, what you get to the issue of them needing it is the fact that beyond just our ability to regulate firearms, we have millions of illegal firearms on the streets today. Mm -hmm. um, if I wanted to buy a fully automatic AK-47, I wouldn't go to a gun store to do it. I'd, I'd go to Texas and I'd call a few people and I'd buy it out of the back of a trunk in, you know, Laredo. And it's not to say that um, that's, by all means, that is entirely illegal transaction. It's a black market transaction. It's illegal for me to buy, possess, transport, all those things. But we have a proliferation of illegal firearms on the streets today that are part of the problem. And, and what that leads to is this conversation and what the NRA tries to claim, yeah. which is, well, yeah. the you know, if you take away the good guys' firearms and the only people who have them are bad guys. And that's one of those untruths that's kind of founded in the kernel of, of truth, is you take a fact and you turn it into this, this misleading uh -huh. situation. So, um, I, I don't think I have, right now, I don't have anything against handguns or an, indiv an individual's ability to legally possess or transport them if they follow the law. And it's, it's strange to me, you know, the CPL process in the state of Michigan is, is a relatively thorough process. Right. And it begins with an individual paying money to take an NRA, a class from an NRA certified instructor, and it's an NRA certificate that one receives to take to their county clerk to pay the fee, to be fingerprinted, to have the state police run a background check. You know, all of those things are involved. One of the things, though, I would like to see is I'd like to go beyond that. I would, I would like to see, if you're going to have a CPL, I want to see recurrent mandatory training because, you know, we don't, in the Marine Corps, we don't simply teach someone how to use a rifle and then say, you know, have at it. You, you, the rest of your career, you are routinely training right. with that. Right. And, and I know... The FBI does that too. Right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, well, most of your well, police forces... Law enforcement agencies do. Yeah. I, you know, and the, the a lot. Right. And you talk about the militarization of the police forces, that, that adds a cost burden to the community police agencies because now I have to increase the numbers and types of weapons that my individual police officers are trained on and you know, develop proficiency standards and how many rounds per month should a police officer be firing in order to be safely proficient on right. that firearm. So all of these are, are, are really nuanced conversations that are worth having and we're not having a nuanced conversation right now. I mean, we we got to get into things like Why legal and civil rights. <laughs> yeah. With the, the idea of, of, of militarization of the police force happened during the Bush administration, and it was largely curtailed during the Obama administration. I don't it bring up an interesting nuance, if you will, in terms of what actually happened to that stuff. Uh, and, you know, we, now we don't we're not using it anymore, or where are those? Uh, 
uh, bulletproof vehicles that we're, we hire our departments of, of police, maybe even in Flint, we're, we're, we're being given. And, and how, how do you feel about Trump's new uh, need to remilitarize the, the police, local police officers? I don't agree with it. I, I mean, there's, there's, without question, again, this police forces need to have the capacity to respond in places like Chicago and Detroit and Los Angeles and but the idea that local police agencies need a deep capacity for military style capability is just not supported in general by um, by the facts and my concern is that when you militarize the police forces you change the mindset of that force um, and I, I think we see it today in, in the way police interact with their community you know, it changes their mindset. I don't think that there's any reason why they need that capacity. Do I support their ability to have uh, vests to protect their organs? And yeah, absolutely, of course. Um, but you know, most of what they do can be handled largely with handguns and shotguns. Um, and uh, I'll tell you, the uh, I had a good friend who was a police officer in Richmond, Virginia, and he said that their Part of their procedures, if you were responding to a, a school shooting, um, was that they would take shotguns inside, but they would not take rifles inside because of the concern regarding overpenetration, because of the, the the types of rounds that are used in the rifles, and you know, I can shoot through this wall, but I or shoot through this person, but I also might go through that locker and into that classroom, and we, you know, over penetration actually was a problem that the FBI was dealing with going back into the 70s. The FBI's hostage rescue team led a lot of the um, the development of the tactics and procedures in terms of what types of weapons they were using in close quarters mm -hmm. for that exact reason. Um, and the, the school I worked in was a was a training thing on weekends mm -hmm. for various law enforcement right. agencies. Right. I, on occasion, I got to watch their drills when I'd go in there on a weekend. But it was interesting, and, and, and the selection of weapons that they had was appropriate. Yeah, and then, I mean, that develop, that all develops over time. I think my concern is that it's the, it, it's like the, even the uniforms. You know, when we, I've seen in Texas where there are law enforcement agencies in Texas that literally wear military style camouflage uniforms and responding to direct action requirements in an urban area. It's, it's absurd, it's, but it's, it's, yeah. they, it's they, they really, you, you put a law enforcement officer on a direct action response team in Houston and stand him next to, next to a Navy SEAL and they really are equipped in very similar ways with the exception of perhaps the police officer has a vest that says police on the back. Uh -huh. So I wanted to ask if we could, have we exhausted this one for a while, this issue? I, I think so. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm interested in hearing um, what your take is now that you've been around talking to people all over the district. Mm -hmm. um, what are the issues that are really, um, that you could do something about if you get to Congress yeah. that are concerning our district? That you're, what, what's coming to the top? It's uh, standing by working families to ensure that uh, those families can earn, that work a job that pays a reasonable wage so that they don't have to work two or three jobs as a family to make ends meet. It's being able to go to the doctor when you're sick or take your kids to the doctor when they're sick. Oh, um, and yeah, healthcare for all Americans. And it's, it's that, it's really, we talk about it in terms that are that direct. It's, you want to be able to make a decision that if you go to the doctor and you need a medication, you shouldn't have to make a decision about whether or not you can make your car payment or get paid for your medication that month. And that's probably not even a great comparison because if you really need a medication, I mean, there's chances that it can cost as much as, uh, I think, $45,000 a month. I talked to, we were in a hospital in Kalkaska <laughs> that had a hemophiliac there, and the hemophiliac was on Medicaid, and the, the medication alone for their treatment was $45,000 a month. Well, um, I was reading a thing on, on uh, MSNBC, the, the AIDS drugs are being made available to the, to the people in Africa for a dollar seventy-five a month. If you had to buy it here, yeah. you're up into the thousands and thousands of dollars a month. And what can be done about that? That's because what we're doing is we're paying to subsidize 
everywhere else. There's a reason why if you drive across, you know, go across the Sioux, you know, you can buy those same drugs at a fraction of the cost of what you can here today because the government of Canada is negotiating those drug prices with directly with the manufacturers. Um, and so that, and then you that can, African one was also negotiating with the suppliers. So, and and yep. it's, it is an aid program. Right, it's right. So that would be where's, where's, so that would be like registered through like USAID. It's not the ID necessarily. It's the Bush. Um, but I mean, it was there was that plan, and it was and that they would they actually very, yeah. they raised money for that, and some of it was mm -hmm. government money, but some of it was outside money. Yeah. So but again, it was a negotiated. I, I don't know. It's a negotiated it's price. And that's one of the things that they've actually contracted. The Trump administration has contracted support for birth control and AIDS treatment in develop, undeveloped nations as well. Um, so going back to, so working families, wages, and healthcare, um, critical modern infrastructure, which is one of the biggest issues for us, and I begin at the top of that list is broadband penetration, um, because yeah. we can't educate our kids, we can't attract new businesses, we can't compete for the future and, and engage in what is really a global economy mm -hmm. if we don't have high speed access. And, Many of the stopgap solutions that are there today, which is like free to air or the programs that like NMU is doing, they're good stopgap in terms of the internet service provider of last resort. But what we really need is high-speed fiber optic. I mean, that is the that is the way that we're going to be able to get people connected. Kids sometimes only have a local library. That right. the local library has that right. access, you know, and that's something yeah. to provide for them. But they have to go there. Right. And their there, in Kalkaska, which is a county-owned, yeah, it's a county-owned hospital in Kalkaska. They have an internet cafe that they open free to the public because they know that the, the library is in trouble, and the, so they they do that. But we shouldn't have to rely on that type of stuff. We need to get, and there is a absolutely a government solution to that in terms of public public private partnerships and cooperatives. It's. Uh, it's the rural electrification model. If we can, if we can build roads and put power to everybody, we can do that very same thing. Yeah, and actually, when we're building those roads or resurfacing those roads or putting in new hydraulic infrastructure or drainage or new natural gas lines, well, while you're in there, you should be laying, you know, deploying fiber optic as well. And there's actually a caucus in Congress right now that's relatively focused on some of those solutions but they, they just are struggling to get that funding. That would be critical for us to be able to do in these rural areas. I mean, I... Is uh, that considered big government? <laughs> I mean, some, know, some people don't want the government engaged, right? It depends on where you stand on the issue, mm -hmm. whether it's big government or not. I mean, this, right. this big government idea, I find really disgusting. One of the things, that, right, one, but one of the things people that you can actually... People are on both sides of it, if they really analyze where they're standing on issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the road is government. The bridge is government. Yeah, I mean, you know, I can't build the road. No, the dam. <laughs> so th those options are th th those are there, and and that's actually something that that's really that crosses party lines. Yeah. You know, and they, they want all of us. Absolutely. You know, and I talk to a lot of people that in this district that are on dial-up. So, oh yes. You know, still. There are people in this county who are. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So. So beyond that, and of course, we do have there's there there are roads and hydraulic and 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 other infrastructure that's more traditional thinking. But you know, broadband for us is the digital divide is going to continue to grow. We're going to get left behind. So does that really come up when you're going around? It really comes up to raise that issue. Yep. Good. Yeah, absolutely. They they like well, we don't even have internet up here, and so in in. What about in, the Great Lakes? It, it doesn't come up a lot. It's very important for us, and we talk about it in terms of pr preserving our infrastructure, and clean water is, is a critical piece of that. It's our, probably our most important natural resource here. And so what we have to do in order we talk about things like Line 5, protecting our water, one of the key components of that is the beginning. We've got to work harder to make a faster transition to renewable energies. We've got to move away from our reliance on petroleum infrastructure. And there's a lot. There's some folks that want to hang on to those petroleum jobs, the pipelines. But there are. We have to convince them, and many of them are coming along to the idea that there are actually really good jobs, good paying jobs in um, in renewables. And that particularly, you, you can make the case in the UP for renewables because there are a lot of people up there that are paying 23 cents a kilowatt hour for their electricity. 
because they're buying it from Wisconsin. They're buying excess energy from Wisconsin. And so organizations like the, the Hannaville Indian community in Delta County, they're investing in a solar array. So that they can drive their own power and they can sell back power to the local community at a reduced right. rate. You know, we were just having that conversation as we drove over from Traverse because if you come down um, 22, when you're leaving Traverse and you go by the windmill there and there's a big solar array, you know, that developer who owned that property told us the city of Traverse City decided that we were, they were gonna move toward a goal of renewable energy to produce as much of their city energy be renewable by 100% by 2020. That's only so. the energy that the city government That's right. Uses. It's not the whole No, it's not city. the entire grid. But it's just... <laughs> it sort of gets... So, people right. hear it wrong. I mean, but it's a step mm -hmm. in the right direction. It is, and it's but one Are of the interesting debates... One megawatt? Or where are you I, I don't remember the total number. I know that it was enough to get them 20% yeah. closer to their goal, I think. Yeah. But, you know... The developer told him he'd sell it back to them at something like 11 and a half cents a kilowatt hour, which sounds like a great deal in the UP. Yeah. But the turbine that, that they were getting it from was at nine, like nine cents an hour. So they're paying a premium in order to transition to renewables. And so that's an important conversation to have. Yeah, there's always a trade off. But, you know, yeah. wind now you can get for five cents. Yeah. So, I mean, it's mm -hmm. very competitive with any, yeah. and, well, you know, any yeah. fossil. I, I got a question for everybody. You want a windmill in your backyard? Do I? Doesn't yeah. it have to be in the backyard? You know, I, I, well, I, a lot of people look at it that way. Right. Look at look at the East Coast, those enclaves where the very wealthy live. There are no windmills because they didn't want to look at them. Well, they didn't want to look at them. If it was in their view, they can't. See they were moved. They can't yeah. See it. We we th there are options most certainly, particularly in this district. You know, twenty percent of our total land area in this district is state and national forests. You know, you could put seven hundred windmills between Saney and and yeah. uh, and uh, where's the picture box? <laughs> it just flew out of my head. Um, Munising. 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 So between Saney and Munising, you put seven hundred windmills out there, and, and there's probably only five people would ever see them. So, I mean, we have that opportunity, or offshore options as well, so. The, um, but solar is a lot less intrusive than wind. There's no question about that. It's less intrusive, but. And also, it takes much less maintenance. And we got a lot of clouds in Michigan. <laughs> yeah, but. That needs to be a combination. Listen, I've got 20 panels on my roof, and I mean, I produce 400 kilowatts last month, but, and I have, I have only about four and a half hours a day that is really good collecting because of the trees on it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we spend five less than six dollars a month on our electricity. Yeah. So you get credit for it. I mean, and more importantly, you're off the grid. Yeah, and I charge an electric car. Right. So I mean, I'm not paying for gasoline, and my electric car doesn't require any maintenance practically right. except for tires. Is, is any of that subsidized? Tax breaks? Uh, well, credits? when we put the solar up, yes, there was 30% off your taxes. I mean, off that, 30% of the cost of the solar. Right. I could deduct from the taxes. That's right. I don't know how long that's going to last. Um, and the car, yes, there was, of course, the electric car, $7,500. Mm -hmm. but, um, but, you know, I've driven 18,000 miles without using gas. That's great. <laughs> you know, and it's interesting. If you go, it's it's on a small scale. You see how it can be implemented. If you are driving, there's a rest stop on the Sini stretch, I believe, in this in the national forest there, and the rest stop has its own solar array. I mean, it's off the it's off the grid. <coughs> Charge plug. No. Oh no 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 it doesn't. You can't drive. <laughs> you're not. You're. I mean, this is what you need. Yeah. You need to get yeah. that stuff out there. <laughs> indeed, indeed, and that's you know that's one of the big things. And if, if the governments, and not just the federal government, but indeed the government, the states, and the feds, and the municipalities are investing in the technology, then if you over time it will reduce the cost of, of you as an individual being able to purchase that technology and be on board. And to your point about wind not being the long term solution, it's I, probably I didn't say it wasn't. but well. But, I think that the key is for us is it's like it's exactly you need all of it. Yeah. You need to you know, yeah. natural gas to wind to solar, and it's it's a transition that's probably going to take 
you know, as much as a century to be able to do. But we've got to commit to making the transition. Standing our ground on the status quo isn't going to move us forward. So, it's like so many things, it is nuanced. I mean, where I live, we don't get much wind, and I wouldn't put wind out there anyhow because it would be obtrusive, it would be ugly, it would be sound. And, but there are, I could probably buy some property up higher on the hill and, and get one that would be higher effective. But that's not what it's about, I think. But, um, I want to know, go back a little bit to guns. Mm -hmm. I'm s assuming that, that you wouldn't mind if CDC uh, opened up the study again on uh, the public health. Uh, I think it's absolutely critical. If I'm a lawmaker, I need data. I need to know, I need to understand the problem. And I can't understand the problem when everything that's being collected and being provided is always being questioned because of the source. We, we need to have, we, we need to approach it as a public health crisis, a consumer protection issue, and we need to invest in understanding the problem. So absolutely. I was that. To that point, when you're talking about for, um, I don't know the acronym for being able to carry your own weapon, all that information is going to the NRA, and to what purpose are they are they using it? Right. Am I going to be on a short list someday because I because I'm an extremist on the issue? You know what I mean? It's yeah. A, well, I, I well, my physician like asked me about firearms at uh, one of my yearly checkups, filling out his form. Well, I just refused to answer. It's, what What is the question exactly? Uh, you know, firearms do, in the home. Do you have firearms? Oh. In the home? You know, when you yeah, if you have handy. children and you go to your pediatrician, that's that's one of the questions. Sure, it's like, do you have smokers? Do you have guns right. at home? I, exactly. I, I find that terribly intrusive. And like you yeah. say, am I going to be on a list? But you know, maybe yeah. it'll induce a conversation, and the physician might say to you, "You're no safer having a gun at home. In fact, you are more at risk. Your child is much more likely to be suicide." You, it's going to be used on, on you. Have, have, have a discussion. About well, maybe maybe people with, with, with small children, sure, but I don't. You know, I, I, I have weapons for hunting and, and home defense. I mean, I, I, two, year, two years ago, I had a state police officer pounding on my door at 2 o'clock in the morning wanting to serve a warrant. I didn't know it was a cop. But I went to the door with my shotgun. Oh. <laughs> and I opened the door and I said, I've got a shotgun. You know, I opened the door and I said, I've got a shotgun right next to me. And he said, Oh, okay. He wanted, well, it was a wrong address. <laughs> of course. You know, that I mean, but, but, you know, it was a law enforcement. I told him I had a weapon because he certainly had a weapon and I think his partner had a weapon. It's, that type of thing. It could have easily been somebody a uh, home invasion. No, and and being in a, in a rural area, you know, you call a cop. You know, it's sometimes you gotta wait. I just feel safer for the weapon. I don't carry one, but I have one at home. I don't know. To your point on being um, on a list, can you elaborate on that? Because I don't, I don't understand what direction you're. What does, where goes the information for those individuals who want to to uh, pack? So, the NRA would have only they would have your name. I don't believe they'd have your address. Um, the information when you take your certificate to that you go to the county commissioner and the county commissioner fingerprints you and all that information goes to the michigan state police then so the turn, I, the, I, I believe it goes to the fbi then too because the information goes into the national criminal oh, the national i can't remember the name of the database but it's it's the database that the like if a cop sits in a car and types in your right. um, driver's right. license, that comes up. Interestingly enough, now in the state of Michigan, that cop cannot look to see if you own a firearm unless they have probable cause to do so. It's different in every state, but yes, that national criminal or national database, it's not a criminal database, but it's the national database that they have access to, so when they, so when they, when they run your 
when they run your license plate, they get your auto registration and your driver's license number, they get all the information on uh -huh. you. And so they'll know, it'll come up in that system if you have a felony warrant, they'll know you have a uh -huh. felony warrant. So, but um, now I, that automobiles are more often being used as lethal weapons, maybe that registry will also become. I, I would tell you that I think that, you know, in all truth, yeah. um, if you had a registry process that was similar to what you have in terms of automobiles and a licensing process and a, a uh, an insurance requirement, I mean, I think that from the perspective of a gun owner, I think that would serve gun owners mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. I know that there are gun owners that don't want a registry because they think that it means that people are going to come after their guns, but I that's a risk that I would be willing to accept in order to create a safer system by which gun owners can be managed. And again, you know, I want to know gun that owners that. managed. Yeah. That just sounds gun ownership being managed. So yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I take your point, but again, I make the comparison to um, what you have in terms of well, uh, automobiles. Oklahoma City bombing. Does anybody regulate fertilizer and diesel now? Yes, they do. If you go buy ammonium nitrate fertilizer, you can only buy certain amounts, and the FBI is going to know yeah, very soon yeah, if you yeah, buy very much. You go somewhere else and you buy some, and you, it's, you, uh, you, you find a farmer that has an excess. So, I mean, if you're if you are making info, you are going to quickly catch the attention of law enforcement. Um, so, I, I mean, yeah, you could do it, but I mean, the, the, the guy that just did those horrible things in Las Vegas, he had a lot of ammonium nitrate. Well, he was trying to stockpile it, right? He was trying to do it so as well. But. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. Come on in. Let me go grab a few more chairs here, too. Good to see you. Hey, Rob. It's so dark in here. I know. My wife, Jan. Just your eyesight. I know. It'll adjust. Woo. Hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. Nice day out for a ride. Yeah, well, it is. <laughs> Very you, know, you get this time of year, and you always wonder, like, will it be the last one? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. We're going to see more chairs okay. here. You guys can go ahead. I don't need a sock. Yeah. No, one more question from the neighbors. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't think it would be so high. I mean, you have to run it. But we can use a lot of energy. We have just a couple more questions. I just only have one from one of the neighbors. Um, for um, the support in the single pay for um, medical, mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about that? That's well. So as a Marine, I had government provided health care for over 20 years. Uh -huh. um, so I see how it can work. Um, I think that if we're gonna if we're gonna transition that direction, we would begin by saying that. We need to provide better access to the Medicare. I would like reduce the age of Medicare. Most recently, they just upped eligibility to 67. Yeah, how far are that? Yeah, and I would make I would make it more accessible to the point that, at a minimum, every American would have the option to buy into um, the Medicare system as an option to uh, as an alternative to private insurance. You know, so if you're 65 and you were counting on getting your Medicare, that just maybe got pushed off a couple of years, so that's two more years that you'd have to you know, buy private insurance. The other thing is that we, if you allow healthier populations to buy into Medicare, you st start driving down costs overall. And that's probably one of the great ways to do it. Um, I think that we can't flip that switch overnight, though. Right. Um, you, you, you can't just shut it down and say Medicare for all. I mean, we've got, this is almost 20% uh, of our overall economy. Um, it's in this district alone, healthcare service providers are the primary employer. Right. Um, so that's going to have an impact on that system. So you got to make a reasonable transition. And again, this is why I advocate for having reasonable solutions that both parties can engage on. And, Interest, I think it's very interesting that the president recently called Chuck Schumer and said, let's work on this health care thing. Because the fact is, is to really fix it, to address the shortfalls and the shortcomings of, of, of the Affordable Care Act um, and the transition to something that works better, the, the, we're going to have to work together because it's going to take several years to transition to a system. And so if it's just one party or the other trying to shove it through, I mean, we've seen that that's just not going to work. I've been hurt by the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. Because your premiums have gone up? My premiums have gone up. I can no longer afford 
several of my medications mm -hmm. I'm just doing without. Yeah. And uh, premiums, right. all the deductibles. Right. I mean. So your premiums go up, you increase your deductible to try to keep your premium under control. And, yeah. I, it, well, one of the first things, one of the biggest shortcomings is that when they pushed the ACA through, a lot of it was very well intended. We've, we've seen a lot of good things come of it, but they set aside, they knew that they couldn't get it through if they tried to tackle pharmaceutical costs and insurance companies at the same time. So because they didn't deal with that, it's one of the reasons why we're seeing you know, increased costs. And the most medical centers around here, where it's Munson and Travers or the, the, the county hospital in uh, Kalkaska, um, we'll tell you about a quarter of their costs are pharmaceutical. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I believe that. Mm -hmm. and when, you, when you get into you know the folks that really need something that's highly specialized, whether it's the hemophiliac patient or someone who's going through a certain course of uh, cancer treatment, then those those costs really get out of control. Oh yeah, my my uh, autoimmune disease, I was paying. Depending on what time of the year it was, right. where my deductibles were for that, right. from from forty dollars to to eighty dollars. Affordable Care Act comes into play. Now it's fifteen hundred dollars a month, and I just see a direct correlation. That I'm being punished, so other people can have affordable for them insurance, and, and I don't think that's right. There have been a lot of people that have experienced that. I, I hear from families mm -hmm. all the time that their premiums have gone up, that their costs have gone up, and, and part of that is that there are key features of the Affordable Care Act that have been essentially sabotaged that, you know, mm -hmm. like the subsidies that are supposed to improve the quality of the access or the quality of the programs and options available to you in the market. If you don't have options available to you and you only have one provider in your market, well, they can charge you whatever they you're, want to you're charge. You're stuck. Yeah. Yeah. You're stuck. So if, and there's a couple of key things, you know, the, if you rely entirely on the open market in terms of insurance, no insurance company is ever going to insure a sick or an old person. Right. It just does it's like it's like an insurance company insuring a bad driver. You know, you got three DUIs and two, you know, two or three auto accidents, they're not you're not gonna get insurance, right? And it's kind of the same thing. The only difference is we're not all bad drivers, but we are all gonna die. We're all gonna need health insurance at some point in our life, we're probably gonna need significant intervention. 80% of Medicare costs are paid in the last two months of life. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's one of the key features that, that by, by moving more from healthier population into Medicare, or giving the healthier population an opportunity to buy into an affordable plan with maybe premiums banded by income level. Um, I, as a veteran, too, I actually think Medicare is a strong solution to providing better acute and primary care for veterans. And do away with the VA. I would let the VHA continue to work on issues like traumatic brain injury, um, Agent Orange exposure, behavioral health issues. Uh, behavioral health being like really one of those important things because with 22 veteran suicides a day, right now the most vulnerable population is Vietnam veterans. So what I think about as a, as a contemporary veteran, is what is my generation going to be looking at 30 or 40 years down the road in terms of behavioral health? But yeah, acute care, for example, the Veterans Choice Program right now says I can go to a hospital like Kalkaska County Hospital. I can go there for treatment provided there isn't another facility within 40 miles. The thing is that there is one in Traverse City. So if, if I went to Kalkaska for a colonoscopy, well, they couldn't do it for me because there's a veterans facility within 40 miles. But if I go to the veterans facility, they can't do a colonoscopy. So they send me to Saginaw. Oh. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. if, if you were able to bring veterans into that, the, the Choice Act is a third party program. They just insert an insurance company manager into the process so I can no longer do, deal directly with my provider. Um, I would have to, if on a veterans choice program, if I went to a doctor for my shoulder injury and that doctor said, um, you need about six months of physical therapy to prevent surgical intervention, uh, I can't then be referred directly to a PT provider. It has to go to Veterans Choice, Veterans Choice has to call the provider, then the, they have to call me back and tell me they've set up that appointment. And oftentimes that increases the delay. Hi, how are you? Please, come on over. So, 
I can Mary, no, that's chill. Okay. Here, I, I can get up. No, this I, is fine. I can stand. Well, I'm standing anyway. So I, I do think that 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 is a, a solution right now because what we have is we don't have a healthcare system in America. We have like four healthcare systems. You know, we have systems for veterans and military. We have systems for the, the elderly in Medicare and the indigents in Medicaid. Um, we have a system that is effectively like the, you know, if you have employer provided health insurance, that's like more like a German system. So you have all these different systems and they don't and really have, work well together. You have on your drivers. Yeah, me medical liability, right? Mm. Yeah. So you're paying, as a matter of fact, over the course of your lifetime, between the money that you, like if you have employer provided insurance, the money that you're paying in your premiums, the money that your employer is paying for that and not putting in your pocket, um, the Medicaid that you spend on, Medicare, which you're going to pay overall, you know, the, as you point out, you know, the liability insurance that's in your driving, your lifetime earnings, you're paying about 25% of your total lifetime earnings or losing earning potential right. in healthcare. I think we'd be better off if we just had a government program and you paid into it and you were covered on it. That's what we're talking about. It's like, how do you transition to, uh, and, and one of the things you bring up that, that I think is part of the problem is how the conversation has been hijacked. And if you say single payer, people hear socialized medicine. Well, socialized medicine is government doctors and government hospitals, and that's not at all what we're talking about. Right. Um, we have a, a great health, we have great capability and capacity, we have organizations like Mayo Clinic. I mean, it's some of the best healthcare in the world, but we don't have the best outcomes. And so if we worked better in terms of how we engage with our healthcare and improve our outcomes, then I, we'd all be healthier and have a better option. You know, if, if you have a system where, you know, your doctor has no incentive to keep you from developing type 2 diabetes, but if you do develop type 2 diabetes, your doctor will get paid to cut your foot off. Right. Okay, so I mean that's that's part of the problem is that you know improving outcomes to keep a healthier population. So that's kind of, kind of my thoughts there. Okay. okay. Yeah. Just a few neighbors yeah. wanted us sure. to because we're yeah. here for it, it's, the it's neighborhood. How you, I mean, it's, it's how you talk about it. It's how you you know take a discussion. It's like you know anything that you talk about as being free, you know universal, free to all. There's a whole segment of the population out there that's going to say, nope, screw that, right? Well, um, nothing's free. Nothing's free. That's right. So, I mean, it's, it's about how you talk about how you do it. It's a real conundrum because of, of the divisions in the society. And as you said, single payer has been connected with right. pure socialism. Right. And but it doesn't, doesn't work that way in many other countries. Yeah. One of the conversations I have is like, do you know anybody? Or, you know, it's like, are you on Medicare or do you know anybody on Medicare? Some are they happy with it? We're all on Medicare. Right. I mean, yeah. I, Outside, yeah. maybe outside of this conversation, right? Yeah. But that's, we talk about you know how we discuss it. Is you know, do you know anybody that's not happy with it? No. You know, so. <laughs> so. Well, it has its issues. It's good. A lot. Really good. In order to make it really good, you have to have supplemental Well, and that's kind of where I think that the market can continue to play a role in that, you know, in terms of what you what you might have access to in terms of supplemental coverage, and, but probably not through your employer. You know, that's one of those many factors. That, that's bad for the employee as well. Right. Because in so many cases you couldn't transport it. Well, at least now I guess you can. Right. But You're not stuck I'm in a job. I'm afraid of where we're going with the, with the Trump thing, whether things will be transportable. Right. Well, and, and I think that concerning to me is, as a minister, is that now our employers are going to be able to um, decide what our faith behaviors need to be vis-a-vis um, -vis birth control, vis-a-vis, -vis, um, you know, having maternal health care. Um, there are a number of conservatives that don't think you should have prenatal care uh, because if you found out something was wrong with the baby, of course, your first thing would be to kill it. And so we're now allowing, I never, I worked in hospital settings and in social service all my life until I moved up here and became a minister and I never had any benefits. And I mean, they just don't. 
they, you know, in the South, they don't give you, they, so this whole employer thing is weird to me. But to work for somebody who decides what your religious beliefs are supposed to be, that now we have to go to work for somebody and ask them, well, you know, Matt, do you think birth control is okay? Are you going to pay for it? Are you going to pay for breast cancer? Right. Are you going to, I, this well, and it's not even just the religious element, which is the prevailing factor in this conversation. It's it's a subjective decision made by your employer, right? In terms about of your about your health. My bottom line view is, and it doesn't whether it's contraception or any type of reproductive care, that is a decision that is between you and your doctor and nobody else. Right. And you shouldn't have your insurance company weighing in saying, well, you you can't have that, but you can't have this. I mean, and you know, it's interesting because. All of this tends to focus, this conversation tends to focus on women's reproductive rights. Yeah. And well, that's because men get to do whatever. I, I, you know, I talk about that's this true. relatively... That is true. I talk about it relatively infrequently. No you offense, know, I, I you mentioned guys. That I had, try stopping so. giving Cialis to anybody. I know, I mean, that's right. not allowed. Let's say well, I'm, I'm an employer and I decide my employee shouldn't have that, right? Right. So, they shouldn't have Cialis and yeah, they shouldn't right, have right, right, right. Well, or here's, you know, this is, oh. anytime <laughs> someone talks about the government being involved in these types of decisions, so when, you reti when you're a man and you retire from active military service, you're usually, you're going to be the age, between the ages of, say, 41 and 55, right? And so men who have had their families and are getting ready to leave active duty, Quite frequently, when they're leaving active duty, one of the last things that they'll do is that they'll have their vasectomy. And it is such a frequent thing, like in Portsmouth, Virginia, the Portsmouth Naval Hospital where I was stationed, there is a dedicated webpage just to <laughs> vasectomy. Really? Yes. And when you, and it says, hey, Tuesdays and Thursdays mornings, 8.30 a.m., conference room, B101, you know, information up. session. So you come in, there's 40 men in this room with you, there's a nurse will will read something off a card, show you a short video, give you a consent form oh because God. you have to take your consent form and have your wife sh sign it before okay. you go. Um, and then you as you have walk, your wife, wife to sign it. You have to yeah, have your wife sign your consent form. Absolutely, because you can't make that decision on your own. Your wife has to be able of part of it. So it's you leave. Like having an abortion. So you leave, and they give you a slip of paper that has your procedure date and time on it. And it's like probably f sometime the following week. And you show up that day and all those guys that are in the room with you before are in the waiting room and they just take you and you, you're in this outpatient room and this outpatient room and they'll have, you know, they'll just line them up and you, you'll go in there, prepped, urologists will come in, do the procedure, you know, oh get, my hit, God. write a script and walk out and you go to the next room. And it's like an assembly line, right? That's government funded elective reproductive health procedure. Um, and no one ever questions it. Matt, your wealth of information. <laughs> so there you go. Have you all already talked about guns? Mm -hmm. Oh, talked a lot about guns. But I'll stick anything? around and talk to you if, if you want. Well, I just don't. Is there? An, I just. I heard Tucker. I've been trying to listen to Fox, so I understand. <laughs> Oops. Sorry. I know. I know. I know. I know. But if we aren't, if we aren't, I mean, you know. Anyway. Anyhow. So, but he he goes. Well, what could be done? Nothing can be done. People are going to do these things, and we're a free society. Well, look at and so, what could be what could be done? It's and I didn't grow up in a country that said what could be done. I, I, you know, and I, I don't, but I don't know if anything can be done anymore. I mean, we passed one of the the, the first major gun laws that was passed in America was during um, during Prohibition in 1936. And it was because of the proliferation of uh, machine guns that were developed. Sub machine guns. Sub machine guns. You go to a hardware store, give them your forty-five bucks, and you had a proud right. owner of a machine gun. Are so you the, serious? So that's sure. because they, yeah. what yeah. had happened is it's, it's really it's that's the right. story of the military industrial yeah. complex over the course of our history. Um, th this goes back to the Civil War. We didn't really have a gun it's culture, so to speak, in America so. prior to the Civil so War because right. people owned muzzle loaders for hunting and they didn't really not, I mean I suppose personal protection was probably a part of that but in the wake of the Civil War the in the with the Industrial Revolution they had start begun processing and making 
more and more effective firearms. I mean, the, the repeating rifle, um, the uh, quick-loading revolvers. I mean, they, they were all developed really during the Civil War and the intervening years coming up to the Mexican-American War. Um, but when those wars ended, the demand for them ended. And so the gun manufacturers needed consumers, and that's where you got things like the Colt Peacemaker, which was the first firearm ever to be given a, a name. And the, uh, the gun manufacturers hired Pulp Fiction writers to write these mm -hmm. pulp westerns mm -hmm. about gunslingers and all that stuff, and it kind of it, it created a market for guns. So that foreign markets. That so and and uh, we actually weren't selling a lot of guns overseas, although John Browning did sell a lot of his design models in Eastern Europe and to the Germans, and you know right up actually into uh, through the through the first World War. Um, the the uh, government of Germany was suing the United States government mm -hmm. for producing the Springfield, which was directly based on the Mauser design. Right. So, and they won. Right. They won while we were fighting a war. Um, so, really, over time, you know, we see the military-industrial mm -hmm. complex and its impact on it. So, the first major gun laws in during the Great or during um, Prohibition, mm -hmm. 1936, National Firearms Act. Um, our next major gun legislation came in 1968. Mm -hmm. Jack Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, I'm okay. Um, so these are these, these moments in American history where we make decisions about how we, we legislate. Um, National Firearms Act is updated in 1972 because of you know, implementation of new technology. Um, and I, I think that this is an opportunity for us to really have a, a, a conversation about the technology, um, you know, about what is in, you know, in Europe they call them weapons of war. You know, they kind of just classify them all as weapons of war. Um, but I think that it's, it's reasonable for us to be having, at a minimum, this conversation. If we want to move the conversation. Well, people often, you know, will talk about assault rifles. It's like, there's not a very, that doesn't really do a whole lot for us mm -hmm. in terms of being able to specifically define the types of weapons. And you know, this, again, goes to the manufacturing industry. The reason that the AR-type rifle, the black guns that look like the rifles, that AR stands for Armalite Rifle Model, and Armalite was, once, once Colt lost their patent on that, and all these other companies right. began to be able to manufacture it, and then with our current wars, beginning back in 2001, um, if you look at the modification and evolution of the, the, the rifle in this endless war, um, there was the introduction of the Picatinny rail system, which is a system that allows things to be easily added onto the rifle. And so now weapons could be accessorized. And for the gun manufacturer, if your margin is only so good with the gun, but your margin is great with the accessories. So that's really, it's the accessorization and fetishization of a little piece of that market, which is the, what you saw with the Vegas shooters, a guy who just was seemed to be obsessed in some fashion in collecting these military style weapons with these accessories that allow them to operate like military weapons. I mean, we really don't even have fully automatic rifles in the military anymore. That's a relatively rare development. Most of the, the everyday rifle that the average Marine soldier sailor carries has a semi-automatic function and a three-round burst, but no fully automatic. So. I got to go. Well, I'm, I'm hey, really, really, see you. really thank you for coming. pleased by everything I heard. And you know, my support. Well, I'm listening. Um, <laughs> yeah, so you you, you took. Thank you. The, G, did I sign that one? Already? This is, is not. That a, this is no. Nominated. No, this, this is, is okay. the okay. Get, me on the, get him on the okay. ballot. Okay. okay, I'll sign that before. It, uh, there's a, a longer discussion yeah, it works. this yeah. morning yeah. on GPS free <laughs> Sicarius program okay. about guns. And, but you got into a lot more of the specifics of the yeah. things, but it's uh, very valuable. And I'm, thank you for running that uh, count. I appreciate it. Thanks. I'll fill this out and come yeah, back. Yeah, we're going to go too. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming yeah. out. Get that, yeah. good. Yeah. Get that fiber optic yeah. out here. Yeah, right? <laughs> I know. Yeah. 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 Continue the conversation. Yeah. You ought to sit down. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I knew you'd be here now. Thanks for coming. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Did we get your signature yeah, check? Yeah, yeah, we are I know. Thanks for coming.
I think it's probably two going for. Have you seen these? Yeah. Huh? Skyler got one of those. Didn't he? Yeah, not quite that big, but he's got one. Oh my god! I kept checking that, so I just couldn't get a video. Not sitting right by him, but one guy was making videos of us. Was he? Yeah. Young guy. Well, this shows. Yeah, this shows about almost an hour of talking. I don't know if it. Let me see. I can't. 